Thus, in that night of my 14th birthday, night, which should be greater revelation than the sunlight which conceals so much, I stood by the tumultuous sea, listening to the long, melancholy roarings of black waters under the near sky, where, in the partings of the curtain of streaked fog, the bloodless moon was like a white, thin skull, drifting without purpose over the many roofs. The dark towers, the abandoned golf course, the grassy tennis courts, the hidden archery range, over the foaming headlands, the saddle of rock, the spur. The waves broke like primal memories of things unknown breaking on my consciousness. I was filled with an almost unbearable excitement as I realized the immensity of life, that which, through its necessary imperfections, might weave a higher perfection than the faultless and restricted days such as I had known. What if everything should be false and nothing true? Nothing true of these humped, naked dunes, wreathed with seaweed, patched with bayberry and beech rose and meadows of billowing Queen Anne's lace and clumps of wild grass. Nothing true of the low, stunted, blackened spruce and hemlock. The leaping tides, the tongues of surf, the sudden sparks of diminished stars. Then all false things should be true, I thought, as true as Miss Mackintosh, who was so very truthful, her red hair gleaming in the sunlight, in the stale nimbus of familiarity, her eyes severe with a resigned but cheerful purpose, her ways methodical, even though the winds should blow her athwart. If all false things were true, however, then all true things should be false, like my false mother, who postulated merely as her theory the outer world, the blowing cherry trees beyond the surf line, the lanes where she had never walked. Where was the truth which should not fail? Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm going to be talking about Miss Macintosh, My Darling by Marguerite Young published in 1965 and set to be reissued in paperback in August 2022 by the resurrected Dalkey Archive as a Dalkey Archive essential book. I have been putting off Miss Macintosh, My Darling, for a long time. I'm not sure why. The way that I sort of gravitate from book to book is, I've talked about it before, there's this interesting sixth or maybe seventh sense of mine that kind of directs me. With this book, uh, as with many others, I was just sort of finally drawn to it. I did not expect to read this book this year. In fact, I told myself that I wouldn't read any more huge books this year, and this may just be uh, a bigger book than even the Unabridged Rising Up and Rising Down because of the effort it takes to stay in its flow and the concentration and engagement that it demands of the reader. Um, so it took me about 30, 31 days, uh, all, of, all of November uh, and a little bit into December to read this book. And I read it exclusively, you know, my, my issues of different magazines and periodicals began to stack up, but it's one of the most rewarding reads that I've, I've ever experienced. It's a perfect read for me. It accords with my tastes perfectly. And, and just to, to put that succinctly, Miss Macintosh, My Darling, is one of those perfect antidotes to the pressure from our culture that wants to condition us to consume more things, more and more things, faster and faster. Let it not be so with books. Miss Macintosh, My Darling, is the 1,200-page magnum opus of poet, essayist, academic, novelist, and beloved creative writing teacher, Marguerite Young. Her body of work is brief, but incandescent. Two volumes of poetry, Prismatic Ground in 1937 and Moderate Fable in 1944. Two historical studies, Angel in the Forest in 1945 and Harp Song for a Radical, which was incomplete at the time of her death, but published posthumously in 1999. A collection of short writing, Inviting the Muses in 1994, and towering at the apex of her career, her monolithic obelisk, Miss Macintosh, My Darling, in 1965. 
Young was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1908, and following her parents' separation, raised chiefly by her maternal grandmother, who would play a vital role in encouraging and developing Marguerite's love of literature. She went on to receive a BA in French and English, an MA in Elizabethan and Jacobian literature, and her PhD in philosophy and English from the University of Iowa. Miss McIntosh's 1,200 densely packed pages are divided only into 82 untitled chapters and devoid of the epigrams and other supplementary matter typically found in ambitious books of erudition and high literary engagement. Each page presents a wall of unique Rococo prose that bespeaks the book's nearly 20-year incubation, during which time seven trunks of manuscript were lost in Paris, but recovered and returned to Young in seven wheelbarrows. In fact, the original manuscript contained an additional self-contained 400-page section that was ultimately excised at the behest of her editors. By the time of writing Miss Mackintosh, word of Young's literary prowess was in the ascendant, her name appearing in lists of prominent American writers. Her two volumes of poetry and her mixture of poetic sensibility and historical facticity in her meditation on utopian experiments in New Harmony, Indiana, secured keen interest in and eager anticipation for her forthcoming masterwork. Tastings of the work in progress appeared in a variety of notable magazines and journals, amplifying both anticipation and expectation. Unfortunately, the book was a critical failure with only a few dim lights from proponents. And Miss McIntosh is shamefully still canonically overlooked. Upon investigation of indexes and contents, neither Frederick R. Carl's two-volume survey of 20th century American fiction, published in 1983 and 2001, nor Harold Bloom's The Western Canon from 1994, nor even David Letzler's The Cruft of Fiction, Mega Novels and the Science of Paying Attention in 2017, include mention of Marguerite Young. Though Letzler comes closest with consideration of Dorothy Richardson's Pilgrimage, Gertrude Stein's The Making of Americans, and Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Hopefully, amid the ongoing canon wars, at least a tertiary skirmish can be won in favor of what Constance Eichenlaub calls Stein's big book notwithstanding, the first American epic written by a woman, or the anima to Melville's 1851 Animus. Within the scant secondary literature on Miss Mackintosh, one can find Kenneth King's 2016 piece, Forgotten Masterpiece, Marguerite Young's Miss Mackintosh, My Darling, in the Antioch Review. A survey of the qualifiers that saturate King's exuberant review is telling of the book's extraordinary quality. Oceanic, incomparable, eccentric, incontrovertibly visionary, incontestably original, masterpiece, virtuosic, landmark, singularly sustained, surrealist, spellbinding, tour de force, exemplary, ingenious, psychotropic, impeccably wrought, hypnotic, astonishing, fantastical, phantasmagoric, literary mastery, grandiloquent, tantalizing, challenging, pioneering, offbeat grace, ornate, rhapsodic, rococo, oracular bravado, ontological pressure cooker, superlative, a fabled cornucopia of exquisite enigmas, an exhilarating challenge. To belabor the point further, Consider also this consummate paragraph from King. Imagine the 1001 Arabian Nights poured into a cosmic blender, pulverized into its essential fluidic nutrients, and its viscosity converted into a deluxe literary nectar. Marguerite Young prodigally synthesizes such a volatile ferment with formidable visionary frisson, penetrating with an uncanny incandescence, usually hidden realms. King perceptively notes what he calls oblique kinships with Joyce, Proust, Faulkner, and Wolf. Many have likened Young's work to Joyce's, but Young herself dismissed this comparison, though she loved Joyce's work. 
Still, the invocation of such modernist powerhouses is far from inappropriate. Joyce's passion for teasing out infinities of meaning from language or languages, and his penchant for a dreamlike wrapping of historical process and Odyssean search for a parental figure, though in Jung's case, the maternal instead of the paternal. Proust, endless interrogation of the boundaries and properties of memory, Faulkner's gothic framework for animating people and place, and Wolf's tragic waves, all are properties of Jung's book. Yet, it feels incorrect to include Miss Mackintosh among the books of these oblique peers. Furthermore, despite or because of Young's book's appearance in the crowded 1960s, among John Barth's Sotweed Factor and Giles' Goat Boy, Pinchon's V and the Crying of Lot 49, Robert Coover's Origin of the Brunists, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, and being bookended by Gaddis's The Recognitions in 1955 and Thomas Pinchon's Gravity's Rainbow in 1973, Miss Mackintosh defies alliance with this glut of proximal work. In addition to Miss Mackintosh's size and high aspirations, there is a much more refined, patient, layered quality that is part owing to a decidedly female sensibility and part owing to Young's enormous intelligence, modernist literary leanings, and taste for beauty above all. Thankfully, the summer 2000 issue of the Review of Contemporary Fiction boasts two long essays on Marguerite Young in general and Miss Mackintosh, My Darling, in particular. Constance Eichenlaub's essay traces Young's writing prowess from the age of three when Young knew she wanted to be a writer through the encouragement and conditioning of her grandmother, who helped a toddler Marguerite memorize the King James Version Bible, through her education, publishing, and teaching, and ends with Young writing poetry from her deathbed in her hometown of Indianapolis. Young remained a Hoosier all her life. This biblical foundation is everywhere present in Miss Mackintosh. Eichenlaub makes clear that Young spurned linkages with contemporary experimental fiction, and Joyce in particular, saying that she wrote in the grand tradition that links back to Don Quixote and even farther back still to St. Augustine. She names Stern's Tristram Shandy, Gogol's Dead Souls, Dickens, and Poe as immediate influences. Lawrence Stern is my god, Young said. Eichenlaub notes Young's attraction to the naturalism of Theodore Dreiser, the tragic comedy of Dickens, the ironic humor of Mark Twain, the epic vision of Melville, the gothic brooding of Edgar Allan Poe, the neoplatonic Christian introversion of St. Augustine, and the American philosophical pragmatism of William James. And yet, despite Scribner's luminous jacket copy, one suspects Young wrote the synopsis herself, and the publisher putting on a full-blown Fifth Avenue parade to celebrate and market Young's much-anticipated landmark publication. It seems that the critical, academic, and otherwise readerly minds of the time were not prepared for such an expansive mind in constant motion and a work of art that vaults expectations. Miss Mackintosh is still unknown and unread today, except among small cohorts and often touted under the banner of maximalist fiction. On the surface, it is easy to affiliate Miss Mackintosh with those big, heady, postmodern tomes of the 20th century, up to and including Gas's The Tunnel and David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. But between the covers, Miss Mackintosh is ill-fitted for this affiliation. For one thing, Young's great novel is not self-reflexive, and the author is absent. It does not engage in postmodern games. It desires not to light a match to itself as artifice. It is neither Barthian nor Calvino-esque. It is more a cross-section of Tomas Mann and Kafka, but not exactly. It is difficult to contrive a satisfactory analog with Young's book. Certainly, there is a kinship with Gertrude Stein, of whom Young was at one time a student, as we learned from Bruce Kellner's memoir essay in the Review of Contemporary Fiction. Kellner himself having been a student of Young's at the Iowa Writers' Workshop in 1955. But even the likeness of Stein and Young runs into trouble. Stein's use of the musicality of language expressed itself in a more compressed form, whereas Young's invocation of the fugue in Miss Mackintosh is much more expansive. 
By this I mean that Stein's repetitions occurred in much closer proximity, whereas Young's happened with more unraveling in between the contrapuntal starting points and overlappings. Still, Stein's The Making of Americans and Miss Mackintosh both deserve Kellner's shining proclamation, a dense forest of words that encourages enchantment and somnolence in just about equal measure. A striking distinction is made when considering the plot and characterization of Miss Mackintosh against, say, Gravity's Rainbow or The Recognitions. In the latter works, the reader is often disoriented concerning plot and character perspective. It takes much concentrated effort to keep a finger on the thread that guides the purposefully convoluted plots, and perhaps even more focused to maintain a handle on which character is the focal point at a given time. Not so with Young. The reader cannot help but know which character is in focus. There is hardly anything else in the frame but a character. And the plot is relatively simple. There is difficulty, of course, but it is an altogether different difficulty than the work of a Gaddis whom Franzen would memorialize as Mr. Difficult in his 2002 New Yorker essay. Young's simple plot in Miss Mackintosh can be boiled down into four segments of a westward journey slash identity quest. Number one, we begin with Vera Cartwheel, whose name implies the ever-turning search for truth, on a bus headed to Whatcheer, Iowa, a place Young said she did not know was real at the time of writing, in search of her childhood nursemaid, Miss Georgia Mackintosh. Number two, the bulk of the book is dedicated to Vera's long reminiscence of her time as a young girl in the gloomy and fantastic New England home of her opium-addicted mother, Catherine, the befuddled and ontologically compromised Mr. Sp Spitzer, and the nursemaid whom Mr. Spitzer brings to the house to tend to young Vera. Number three, the bus ride, which Leon Edel called literature's longest bus ride in his Life magazine review, which eventually terminates at a tavern in Indiana, significantly not the intended destination of what cheer Iowa. And in that small town of Indiana, Vera spends a haunted night. Number four, the next day, Vera goes to the Greasy Spoon restaurant near the Indiana tavern where she meets Esther Longtree, whom Kenneth King rightly calls one of the most extreme, bizarre, unforgettably memorable, and enigmatically riveting characters. King does blunder when he states that Vera arrives in Whatcheer, Iowa to meet Esther. In my reading, again, Vera never makes it to Whatcheer. Her thwarted journey is one of many thwarted arrivals in the novel. It is Esther Longtree's shocking and powerful extended confession that breaks a seal on Vera's own psyche and releases her to express her own confession in the final chapter. The book ends on an unexpected and winkingly ironic mock Victorian marriage plot. Harkening back to King's litany of adjectives, I think oceanic and psychotropic are at the top of the list. The simple plot I've outlined is the substrate upon which Young knits what I took to calling character spirals. That is, all the principal characters are spun out for us in the form of an ever-widening and infinitely recursive spiral to ultimately form each character's conical galaxy. Indeed, like an endless cartwheeling. Imagine a series of spirals that represent Vera Cartwheel, Catherine Cartwheel, Joachim slash Peron Spitzer, Cousin Hannah, Miss Mackintosh, and Esther Longtree. Now imagine a group of straight and parallel lines intersecting the arms of each spiral galaxy. Something like this. These straight lines would be the images, themes, and events through which each character spins. It can take some time for the reader to acclimate to Young's spiral form. Indeed, many readers have grappled with and defenestrated Young's contrapuntal repetition. It may be more appropriate to call the device recurrence than to call it repetition. But if the reader chooses to accept this use of recurrence, it can be invigorating, even liberating, to get lost in the ebb and flow of her sentences and the density of her images. It could reasonably be argued that the book is predominantly composed of a series of sustained character development. Just as Gregory Combs said in his book, The Ethics of Indeterminacy, in the novels of William Gaddis, that everything in the recognitions is plot, we could assert that everything in Miss Mackintosh is character development. Nonetheless, lost in the relentless, frothy breakers of Young's dreamscapes, 
the reader surfaces from time to time and discovers that a story is, in fact, unfolding within the widening gyre of character spirals. It is an astonishing feat of prose and introduces something demanding of the reader that is more than just profusion or relentless contradiction, to name another typical critical invective. Constance Eichenlaub and Bruce Kellner both strike notes of a harmonious and resonant chord in their discussion of the importance of tradition, symbol, and myth-making to Marguerite Young's work. It is important to bear in mind that Young began as a poet and then transitioned to prose. She said that writing poetry taught her how to write fiction. Poetry is a compressed form, of course, that relies heavily on figuration. The other American poet novelist who heralded the American epic with an oceanic novel is Herman Melville, whose Moby Dick was also beyond its era's critical consciousness. A little over a century later, Young offers the feminine counterpart to the American epic and exchanges the Pequod for a bus. Young's churning tides do not crash over ships, they crash over heads, submerging everyone and everything in her big book such that she makes a shimmering underwater Atlantis of the bus ride and forces the reader to don scuba gear to continue the watery journey. Young employs variations of a word bank to connect with and extend a tradition of symbol and myth. Whirlwind, wave, foam, sea, ocean, curl, light, darkness, sun, moon, shadow, pearl, gleaming, star, starlight, shell, and clouds. These invocations reach backwards to the God of Genesis and of Job, creating in the midst of chaos and speaking from out of the whirlwind. And they reach forwards to Virginia Woolf's fiction of existential transcendence, freedom specifically sought under the waves of the sea. Miss McIntosh is in another sense a veritable encyclopedia of mythical and literary conversation. Within the first hundred pages, the prose engages with the Hebrew conception of the Ruach Elohim, or the Spirit of God, that hovered over the primordial waters. The notion of the psalmist of deep calling unto deep from Psalm 42.7, the white horses of John's apocalyptic vision from Revelation 6, the wisdom of the ant from Proverb 6.6, 6. allusions in this text include Poe's doppelganger in William Wilson and his most famous poem, The Raven, as Miss McIntosh has it, a slap, slap, slapping on the floor and then the silence as I saw on the counter the dried inkwell, the quill pen. Shakespeare's dark lady of the sonnets and Hamlet especially take arms against a sea of troubles. Virginia Woolf's A Haunted House, as Marguerite Young has it, all night there had been voices, cryings, rustlings, doors opening, doors closing, and a brilliant invocation of John Milton's Lycidas. Yet once more, Miss Mackintosh, my darling, and once more, it is no coincidence that Milton's poem is an elegy to a friend drowned at sea. The story of Esther Longtree's conception plays on that of the Abram Sarai Hagar triad, ultimately making Esther Longtree a type of Ishmael, call her Ishmael, using metonymy with the recurring adjective mulish and the childhood nickname little jackass. Esther's body itself becomes the site of Eros and Thanatos as she tells the story of her perpetual pregnancy and her multitude of invisible stillborn children who haunt the graveyard where transient men copulate with her. For this and more, Miss McIntosh is not content with the local, but rather the global, is not focused on an era but rather an eon. Her characters run the gamut of literary, philosophical, and psychoanalytic discourse, and the book's setting becomes the entire cosmos. Eichenlaub points out that Wayne Micavilli, in his 1969 article, called Miss Macintosh, My Darling, an intellectual novel that effectively usurped Hess's Magister Ludi, or The Glass Bead Game, Moby Dick, Ulysses, and Finnegan's Wake as the most intellectual novel ever published. And indeed, Miss McIntosh explores and plumbs ontological and epistemological depths that can disorient the lay reader, mainly because Young's idea both is and is not a conclusive metaphysics. Young scrutinizes being and knowing throughout the book, but perhaps most explicitly and exhaustively 
in the character of Mr. Spitzer, who constantly flits between opposing states and ultimately emerges as both states superimposed. The bedridden, opium-addled, dream-entranced existence of Catherine Cartwheel and the staunch rationalism of Miss McIntosh, who in the book is called the rock of ages in a land where all things crumbled, reveal Mr. Spitzer as an in-between of these ambitions Tipital states and place his epistemological certainty in perpetual jeopardy. Around this disorienting character spiral, overt and unflinching contradictions pile up and threaten the tolerance of readers desperate for the black and white of classical logic. Mr. Joachim Spitzer, helplessly in love with Catherine, is a lawyer and aspiring musician, of silence notably, overshadowed by his deceased brother, Perron Spitzer a successful gambler and Lothario whom Catherine favored. Ever since Perron's death, Joachim cannot conclusively discern, first, whether he himself is dead or alive, and second, whether he is Joachim or Perron. The dilemma is spun through more variations than would be possible in hands other than Jung's, and it is in the lengthy Mr. Spitzer section that the prose arches to its poetic pinnacle. The entire section, the entire novel really, could plausibly be rearranged into verse, though the resulting page count would make it impossible for publishers to justify. I experience that curious surge and overload of my senses that keeps me returning to literature's pleasures. I felt as Ishmael slash Job, clinging to driftwood in a vast ocean, watching the sinking Pequod. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. It is no accident that Young includes references to Scylla and Charybdis and the Prometheus-like fate of Tantalus. These hard rocks and whirlpools and eternal yearnings go at least partway toward explaining how a reader can feel navigating the seemingly horizonless open waters of the book's middle and contending with its plethora of ponds asinorum. Young was well acquainted with the British empiricists, the German idealists, and Wittgenstein. Reality is language, Mr. Spitzer said, image of image, image of the rose, which sort of combines Wittgenstein and Gertrude Stein. Thus empiricism, idealism, romanticism, and logic all mingle in a sui generis philosophical cocktail that could be called radical skepticism when looked at from the empiricist reader perspective, or all-inclusive metaphysical superimposition when viewed from a mind welcoming to contradiction. The existence of every object is interrogated and suspected of falsity. Reality and dream in Young's hands blur and blend through her use of recurrence and contradiction, or we could call it superimposition. Again, two properties of the musicality of Miss Macintosh that bewildered myopic contemporaries. But the density of Marguerite's layering is commensurate to the sweetness of the journey, like a baker liberally piping a cake, which grandly rewards the patient and attentive reader. Aside from the philosophical aspects of Miss Macintosh and the psychoanalytic, which are explained wonderfully by Eichenlaub, the book exemplifies Jung's insistence on beauty above all, the beauty of the language as the summit of a work of art. Her sentences are thus nothing short of mesmerizing Baroque cascades of alliterations, waterfalls of naturalism that recall the paintings of John Constable and Thomas Cole. Here is one example of a sprawling single sentence that begs to be the object of one of William H. Gass's spindle diagrams. Her dress of sleazy silk was bright burned orange painted with black sailboats sailing over purple trees and red football players playing over steeples and white skiers skiing over sailboats cascading to the hem and locked acrobats the entire field of outdoor sports it seemed being on her body for her scarf was painted with spidery tennis players and tennis nets and ice skaters skating on silver ponds and red polo riders riding red horses and there were little footballs hanging from her charm bracelets tennis rackets, and ice skates, and golf clubs, and numerous other trophies, some of field and stream, satin fishes running around the hem of her chiffon petticoat, edged with yellow lace, butterflies embroidered upon the knees of her thin silk stockings, and her skirts came up high above her knees, higher when she moved, 
showing her yellow satin garters and pairs of stuffed red valentine hearts dangling from ribbons and faces which were painted powder puffs and the coat seemed shrunken or a size too small like something she might have worn in a remote youth. Another sentence of savory sustenance and naturalism unspools thus. My mother, not easily defeated, not even by time's passage, which should have defeated so many less courageous ladies, not even by stars whirling from the tree of heaven, like the sulfurous autumn leaves whirling in a livid sky, by the fissures of rocks and the flowers in stone and the great chasms of which one could not see the depths, the leapings of long roaring ebony waves where the black coachman was buried though he was bodiless now, and though at times she saw his lantern eyes where fireflies glittered, the white manes of running horses streaking the waves, would try to evoke the return of time, and that proud suffrage captain, which is Cousin Hannah, who had been in grey New England, a warring old maid urging ladies to arise and rebel, and who had been an Araby, a great desert king with whistling shrouds, golden tassels flying in the wind, the leader of the light-footed moon-breasted brigade in a perfumed desert of veils and mists and shrouds under a sky where all silver-lighted and rose-lighted heavens had melted together like one great rose trembling with auroral lights, would try to woo her back from somnolent death into this active life as she might woo her imaginary lovers and loves, some who had abandoned her. Now, when of course there seemed no possibility or only the remotest possibility of the great lady's return before the heavens opened like lightning flashes in the heart of the trembling rose. Now, when if she passed, she passed in distance and she was like lightning without mercurial flashes, thunder without sound of hooves striking on tender clouds, clouds with no shadow of the great horseman with his silver turreted head, clouds without a shadow fringing a star-flowered meadow, clouds with rain or snow or cloudburst. Couple these two incantatory marvels with declarations like, nobody really knows me as I am, and if not, then always. And you'll get a sense of young sensibilities, which are gloriously, exultingly obsessed with piercing that firmament between the waters above and the waters below such as we recall from Genesis 1-6. Often her extended aphoristic passages end on a note that is both dissonant and resolved. For example, reality was that which was unreal and was clothed with the dream of reality, dream with dream, body of this chameleon dream, soul of this dream, the skies and the trees and the hills and the stones of this phantasmagoric world, which was nine-tenths imagination and clouds. The sheen, gloss, and varnish of life is washed in the locutions of a limitless mind. Per Nietzsche's Zarathustra, Marguerite Young embraces the chaos within herself and gives birth to innumerable stars. In addition to the prevailing themes and aesthetics of the book, Miss Mackintosh, My Darling, intrigues readers with its hearty sampling of the bizarre. The bus driver, whom we meet in the opening sentence of the book, fantasizing no less, is a disheveled, irascible drunk who openly ridicules and lambastes figures only he can see and hear. Mr. Spitzer, as if his aforementioned confusions were not bewildering enough, transmogrifies into a pigeon at one point. Stately plump Miss Mackintosh, my darling, sexually assaults the young Vera in a haze of supercharged erotic and grotesque imagery. And in the most outlandish of all the book's antics, Esther Longtree populates her world with a legion of invisible stillborn children. As is Young's want, the very name of the Esther character is infused with allusion. Esther could be a nod to the ancient Hebrew woman who became queen of Persia and ultimately thwarted the genocide of her people. Although that allusion is complicated in its contrast of prevented death and perpetual death, the character's surname, Longtree, is an image of a felled tree. We would refer to a tree as tall were it upright, with its leaves scattered and falling, just as the perpetually horizontal woman both conceives and delivers her ghostly offspring. Young delivers a procession of metaphors for these stillborn, each chilling in its synecdochic incompleteness. A flowering horse chestnut, a bloody flower, a fingernail, a golden hair, a foot, an empty bird's nest, 
a snowflake, a feather, a tear. As Esther copulates with men passing through town, the rustling, whispering, and peering of her invis invisible progeny haunt the natural environment around her. Esther, like all of Jung's characters, is stuck inside the revolutions of her own cartwheel. For every time she just charges a stillborn, she is pregnant again. As with Mr. Spitzer's identity, the reader is forced into ambiguity, though ornamented with a lexicon for Esther's particular suffering that is an uncomfortable mix of visceral and refinement. Indeed, the proximity of the sacred and the profane, the high and the low, are mainstays of Jung's repertoire. For all the excruciating shock of Esther's story, Jung's music is irresistible. If the guilt were as grand as the guilt of clouded nature, then who should point to her, Esther Longtree? And if the cloud was all that was ever real, then who should wish to sweep away the cloud? At the beginning of the final chapter, we find that Esther's Augustinian confession set the stage for Vera Cartwheel to contend with her own epiphanies. I could have confessed much to Esther Longtree, she says, if she had been as much interested in my confessions as I had been in hers. Could have told her that which I had scarcely told myself, that my mother was dead, that opium paradise had crumbled, that I was in mourning for three deaths, that I was in love with an older love than memory provided. At this moment, the reader may remember the amazing fact that the whole book is told in the first person by none other than Vera. Of course, Vera's narration is one of impossible omniscience. Yet the trajectory of the book's westward quest for enlightenment belongs to Vera. The endlessly turning wheel of truth realizes that beauty has failed. Her mother, the gorgeous dreamer, is gone. Skepticism has failed. Mr. Spitzer, alas, is gone, and reason has failed. Miss McIntosh is gone. But Miss McIntosh represents more than learning facts by rote like Dickens's Thomas Gradgrind. Miss McIntosh represents Vera's sexual and intellectual awakening. That night's passage was unlike any night before or afterward, that when I was confronted by the phantom of change. It is, after all, Miss McIntosh who urges Vera not to get caught up in the dreams and visions like her mother, but rather to get out of that enchanted New England house, explore America, and experience reality directly, however complicated that final admonishment comes to be philosophically. Therefore, like Esther Longtree's body, Vera's mind becomes the site of Eros and Thanatos. There is a self-actualization for Vera in the realization that Miss McIntosh's erotic attraction to Vera, or to truth, ended in willful death. In the end, it appears that one of Jung's philosophical pillars is that one cannot get close to ultimate truth without flirting with death. No matter how loudly, how intensely one cries out, where was the truth which should not fail? In hindsight, Jung's extravagant prose is the product of forging a language with which to touch the sublime without being dissolved by oblivion. Like Proust, Jung questions and magnifies memory's limits and importance. After the pivotal nighttime encounter between the exposed Miss Mackintosh, alas, she is not what she seemed after all, and the impressionable Vera, Jung offers a beautifully rendered meditation upon the fidelity or infidelity of memory. Then what was done that crucial night and what escapes now the verbal memory? Memory which, though it may seem all-inclusive and final, is always moving towards something else, the something that cannot be put into our paltry language, and which is so very simple and clear that no one can utter it except by infinite winding and winding among those subtle complications providing more complications, mysteries begetting only further mysteries, questions which can have no answer but the void where we are not. Memory is surrounded by the unknown, the void, and there is so much that we have not heard, much that we have not seen. Memory sometimes provides the one flower more than ever blossomed. Memory sometimes omits the only flower there ever really was. Even though Miss McIntosh did not believe in delving into the past, blowing up cold sparks among the dead ashes. Young, via her narrator, Vera, counters this position. For who had ever known the present moment? The sense of the immediate was freighted with the past, and if it were not, then what would the present be but an empty room, a closed door, 
the hull of an old boat stripped bare of its shrouds, a withered rose, a dead love. So memory being so volatile and inescapable, who is to say then what is real? Shall we trust a drug-addled mind like Catherine's, whose own mind had been all that was left to provide for her a better world, cities, mountains, dead faces, vague, clouded longings, and she could not tell where the divide was between what was real and what was unreal, for the unreal things were real to her, an exile on this subjective star, and the real was unreal. Shall we trust Mr. Spitzer's prismatic perception? For after all, butterflies were colorless, the colors being the effects not of pigmentation, but of the illusion of light shattered on the gleaming mirror scales, as if they were so many geometric prisms, so many prisms dancing on Mr. Spitzer's mirroring mind. Perhaps it is best to agree that the only anguish would be the anguish of knowing entirely what was so, and leave such philosophical thickets behind. Surely no one person can come to know the totality of consciousness, especially in an era where we can all agree that the earth itself is like a moth's wing lost in the enormity of space. Or we can consider this amusing anecdote. On one side of him, a fellow was talking to a dead man. They were arguing learnedly upon whether the soul lives after death, whether it is an elixir, a substance, a speck, a dot, a little man, whether it is gaseous, airy, ethereal, a creature or a subtle non-entity, or quicksilver fading on the air. The dead man said it did not live, and he ought to know. He had sought through the starry universe where the musical so stars sang in the heart of nothing, and had found no being without a body, none which might be called the soul. The living man said that it did live, and was a phantom. As important as memory to Jung as the soul or the entryway into the sublime. For every soul must know its northwest passage, must find that which cannot be found, the crevice narrow as a thread suddenly opening into those great abysses filled with cities of frozen pinnacles and towers. We must be careful not to disregard that that which cannot be found, which has echoes of St. Anselm's ontological proof. It seems that Jung believes that there can be a discovery of the that which cannot be found, even if it be that which cannot be understood. And this entryway, this north, northwest passage, may just be the ear, which comes to be a synecdoche for hearing. The ear, my mother said, was the great continent no one had ever completely known or understood, and no one had ever completely explored. And Aristotle had said that the ear was the doorway to the soul. The importance of hearing and of engaging in the search for the soul's northwest passage culminates in the final pages of the novel when Vera says, I spoke to myself now for the first time. Again, the reader feels a shock at the recognition that Vera has been narrating the entire time and only just begins to speak aloud to herself, creating a sort of self-actualizing feedback loop into her own ear. She mentions that she could have spoken slash confessed to Esther Longtree, but chose not to, highlighting the importance of hearing herself. Then, true to her irresistible form, Marguerite Young has Vera marry a stone deaf man. With a project of this scope, endlessly shaped over the course of nearly two decades, the result can thrust the unsuspecting reader into a version of Mr. Spitzer's reality. Everything seemed off key and out of course. This is inevitable when an artist of Marguerite Young's learning and ability takes the reins on the whole history of thought and literature. She is after no less than that veil of Maya that shrouds the life, love, and truth that does not fail. Such a quest needs space and cannot be accomplished with the equivalent of the outmoded syllogism. syllogism. It is telling that Miss McIntosh's short-lived replacement, Mrs. Hogden, leaves behind a syllogism, syllogism on the blackboard. For Young, this means gathering the seas and stars until the whole universe is possessed by her book, which could perhaps be rolled up like a scroll, just as the skies will be in the end, according to Isaiah and John the Revelator. Vera Cartwheel guides the reader through so immense a landscape of the soul. There was now no landscape but the souls, and that is the inexactitude, the ever-shifting and the distant that when the final page comes, for the final page often seems as illusory and far-flung as our death. It is sudden, abrupt, 
leaving the reeling reader to answer the question of whether Vera's quest to find life, love, and truth is complete or just beginning. My beginning was my end, and my end was my beginning.